Young, smart, and talented, these teenagers lived life on the edge as fugitives. They hacked NASA and the Pentagon, shut down major corporations, learned to fly a plane through books and simulator games, and exposed top-secret government documents with the click of a button. It seems there is nothing these geniuses couldn't do. To a few, they were folk heroes, but to the FBI, they were outlaws. Here are nine genius teenagers whose crimes made headlines and also made themselves targets of the FBI. Colton Harris Moore Moore was a troubled child, at least, that was what most people thought at first. His father was abusive, his mother drank, and Moore didn't get along well with his teachers. When he turned seven, Moore was already doing things that would absolutely terrify kids his age. He ran away from home and lived alone in the woods. To sustain himself, he would break into homes to steal food, water, and other things he needed to survive in the wild. This skill would be useful later in life when Moore became a fugitive. By the time he turned 13, Moore had already been in and out of the detention center for four different convictions, and each time he was confirmed fined for only 10 days. When he got out, he would end up committing a worse crime. So in 2006, he finally got his first major conviction. He was sentenced to three years in detention in a juvenile center for burglary. This would be a hard lesson to an average teenager, but to Moore, it was a moment that shaped his journey as a career criminal. In 2008, Moore escaped from the detention center, a move that turned him into an overnight criminal celebrity. Not because he escaped, but how he did it. He basically walked out of the detention house, and from then on, he became a target of the FBI. Moore went on a crime spree that was both brave and careless for someone who had been named America's most wanted teenager. Reports of his crime scenes suggest that Moore had committed most of the crimes barefoot, which earned him the nickname Barefoot Bandit. While on the run from the FBI, Moore somehow managed to commit over 100 crimes while hopping from state to state. His crimes trailed from Idaho to South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Illinois, and though it is possible another criminal committed some of these thefts, most of them were attributed to Moore. But rather than hurt his image, these reports had the opposite effect. His his fan base grew, and shirts with his face printed on them were sold. Although he occasionally broke into homes to soak in a hot tub, get some cash, or grab some other items which he needed, he once ordered expensive night vision goggles worth $6,500 and a bear mace, which led to the suggestion that he is a survivalist. However, he attained legendary status after stealing and flying two lightweight aircraft. According to the investigators, Moore learned to fly the plane by reading books and practicing with a simulator game. His first attempt at flying was in a Cessna 1 182 aircraft belonging to popular radio personality Bob Rivers. The plane was later found crashed at Yakima Indian Reservation. His second attempt was another Cessna 400, which he stole from Indiana and flew all the way to Greater Bucko Island in the Bahamas. Perhaps Moore soon figured out that while he could learn to fly a plane by reading a book, it took more than that to know how to successfully land one. Call him stupid or a genius, but one thing is certain, he was daring and managed to evade the FBI despite having a $10,000 bounty on him. He was finally captured on July 11, 2010 in the Bahamas while trying to escape on a stolen boat. In a last-ditch effort to escape, Moore threatened to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head with a gun, but later surrendered after being talked out of it. Jonathan James. He was the first teenager to be convicted and sent to jail for cybercrime. At the age of 15, James, who was known by the alias Comrade, did something that was unheard of among kids his age group. He hacked NASA and the Pentagon. This was back in 1999, and although America was already advancing in technology, it was still lacking in one area, cybersecurity. According to James, the government didn't take too many measures for security on most of their computers. They lack some serious computer security, and the hard part is learning it. He wasn't bluffing. James hacked the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, whose job is ironically to detect and prevent threats to the US. Before the breach was discovered, James had already intercepted over 3,000 messages, including usernames and passwords of employees of the agency. Using the access he had, James was able to break into systems in NASA and the Pentagon. Although he didn't mean any harm and was just flexing his skills, this hack was an unforgivable one, and any pride James must have felt quickly turned to despair as the full weight of the United States government descended on him. As a child, James fell in love with computers at a very early age. At first, he was doing what any kid his age would do, and that is playing games. But when his parents realized realized he was spending a lot of time in front of the computer, they tried to restrict his access. As they say, every villain has a story, and this is James's story. It was around this time he flexed his hacking skills, and this must have stalked him, and from that moment on, James began to use the computer for just more than games. He once changed his father's Windows PC to a Linux operating system, just to see how it works. James continued to explore the world of computers, and every attempt by his parents to restrict him failed. He even ran away from home after his parents decided to take away his 
his computer and demanded that they return it if they wanted him back home. Every parent would be worried that such attention would ruin a child's grade, but James' parents had no such problem because James was getting good grades in school. His curiosity drove him to attempt hacking into corporate systems. He hacked into AT&T, which was known as Bell South at the time, and the Miami-Dade school system. It was during his forays that he found a loophole in the International Space Station environmental control software that eventually led to the NASA hack. After the hack was discovered, James was arrested on January 26, 2000, and sentenced to six months in confinement. However, the real price came after he was released from confinement. Apart from losing his zeal, James felt he would always be targeted by the FBI because of his past crimes. He made this known in a note he left behind after committing suicide. This happened shortly after the TJX hack. James was among many other hackers who were being suspected by the FBI. Although he claimed to be innocent, it was clear to him that being a renowned hacker made him an easy target. He said, it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether I win or lose. And sitting in jail for 20, 10, or even 5 years for a crime I didn't commit is not me winning. I die free. Albert Gonzalez. The CNBC show American Greed told the story of some of the most notorious frauds and white-collar crimes in America. Gonzalez and his team were featured in episode 40 of the show titled Hackers, Operation Get Rich or Die Trying. This caption portrays the life of one of the most prolific cyber criminals in America. His parents were immigrants who, like many other successful immigrants, came to America with nothing but managed to earn a comfortable life through hard work. His father owned a landscaping business and they lived in a working-class neighborhood in downtown Miami. As a child, Gonzalez looked nothing like the teen he would become. He was described as a handsome kid who was close to his parents and sister, outgoing and smart. He even helped out with the family business. But then he turned 12 and had his first computer. Like most kids his age, Gonzalez instantly became hooked to the machine. He would spend hours playing games, but then a tragedy struck. His computer had a virus. For most kids, this wouldn't be a life-changing event. But Gonzalez was not like most kids. He was very curious and wanted to get to the bottom of it. He questioned the technician, whom his parents called to fix the computer. He wanted wanted to know how to defend himself against a computer virus. He wasn't satisfied with the response he got, so he decided to find the answers on his own. But like Yoda said, once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. That is exactly what happened to Gonzalez. He became obsessed and started spending more time on his computer. At first, it didn't seem to be a bad thing, and according to his father, it's better than him getting high on drugs or running around with gangs. However, as time went by, it became obvious that this wasn't just a phase. His performance in school dropped, his relationship suffered and he was noticeably more quiet and introverted. All attempts to help him failed, and in 1995, at the age of 14 years, Gonzalez hacked NASA. That was the first time the FBI paid him a visit. Gonzalez was invited to the FBI office in Miami along with his father, Gonzalez Snur, and a lawyer. After talking to the 14-year-old for over four hours, the agents decided not to press charges, but demanded that Gonzalez's parents take away his computer for six months. Although his parents complied, it didn't help. Gonzalez and his crew, the Keebler Elves, hacked the Indian government website and the website of the U.S. Storm Prediction Center. It was all fun and games at first, but Gonzalez had other plans. After coming across personal information like credit card numbers on some of the websites which he hacked, Gonzalez knew he was sitting on a gold mine and wasted no time cashing out. He used the stolen credit cards to buy himself clothes, shoes, games, and CDs, and sent them to different locations. Then, after school, he would go around and pick them up. He also got better at hiding his identity. Offline, he was Gonzalez, a typical teenager and online he was soup Nazi. This way, Gonzalez was able to avoid getting arrested for a very long time. Jose Luis Huertas He wasn't any Robin Hood, according to the police. Spain's most notorious cyber criminal was nothing like the legendary fictional character who stole from the rich to give to the poor. He was just a thief who stole from both the rich and poor for his benefit. The 19-year-old hacker was known by many aliases like Mango and Chimichurri, but was mainly known by Alcasec. His real name is Jose Luis Huertas, and he started his hacking exploits back in 2019 at the age of 15. Huertas became known after hacking HBO and creating over 150,000 accounts which he shared out on Instagram. He also hacked Burger King and gave away free orders and sent out driving licenses after hacking the General Directorate of Traffic. Madrid's electric bicycle services Bisimad and urban transport company EMT were also targeted by the hacker. Because of these acts, he became known as the Robin Hood of Spanish hackers. Although Huertas's genius is undeniable, he soon made the wrong decision when he moved up from being an inconvenience 
to becoming a national threat to the government of Spain. Huertas was a serious threat to national security and an expert in cryptocurrency and hiding funds. But while the law chased him down, Huertas was celebrated in the dark web, especially for his ability to avoid being arrested. He would often communicate to his more than 120,000 followers on Instagram and wasn't afraid to live a flashy and luxurious life in the city of Madrid, where he was also being hunted by the police. Sources from the police revealed that Huertas led a life of luxury inappropriate for someone his age and without work activity. He made expensive trips, wore exclusive brands, frequented fashionable leisure and restaurant venues, and even drove a high-speed vehicle. Among his many mischiefs are hacking Telecinco TV station and making away with 300,000 euros. He also breached the security of the municipal sites and the national police and stole the personal details of over 50,000 police officers. The crown jewel of it all was when he hacked into the general council of the judiciary, and from there he got access to Spain's tax agency from where he stole addresses, account numbers, credit card numbers, and telephone numbers. This was a massive breach of security that implicated most of the citizens. Huertas took so much pride in it that he went on a podcast to boast of how he now had the personal information of about 90% of the population. He also revealed that the data was stored on his platform, Udyat, named after the Egyptian symbol, Eye of Horus. Udyat led the police to finally arrest Huertas after they were able to trace the cryptocurrency with which he bought the servers back to him. A total amount of 543000 $514 in cryptocurrency was transferred from two cryptocurrency wallets belonging to Huertas. To the police, Huertas was no Robin Hood. He was a dangerous computer criminal who had created a platform where he could store and sell the information he had stolen. Michael Calce. In 2000, Michael Calce, who was still in high school, executed a series of attacks that crippled some of the biggest websites on the internet. We are talking about eBay, Amazon, Dell, CNN, and Yahoo, which was the top search engine in the world back then. The total loss from the attack was about $1.7 billion, not counting the psychological impact. The internet and e-commerce world was still in many ways at the infant stage, and the attack caused fear, panic, and uncertainty. According to Michael, the New York Stock Exchange, they were freaking out because they were all investing in these e-commerce companies. And then it's like, okay, a 15-year-old kid can shut us down at any point. Is our money really safe? But Michael wasn't planning to steal. For him, it was all about establishing dominance and control. It was all about proving to other hackers who was the best, and perhaps the need for control also had something to do with his childhood. Young Michael, who would later become known as Mafia Boy, was born in Montreal, Canada. His parents got divorced, and he moved in with his mom. But his father had him during the weekends. Bored and isolated from friends, his father tried to keep him busy by giving him his personal computer to play around with. I mean, what can a six-year-old do with a computer, right? Whatever his dad had thought about, it surely wasn't that his son would become so good with computers that he basically shut down the internet. Three years after his father first gave him a computer, Michael had become so good that he was able to hack AOL's system so that he could continue using their services even after the 30-day free trial was over. The AOL chat room continued to be an inspiration to Michael, who was beginning to know what was possible with computers. He met many more people who were even better than he was in the chat room and was even kicked out of the room on several occasions. This act was known as punting, and Michael thought it was fascinating to be able to do that, so he learned it. Soon he was able to punt anyone who got on his nerves. As he snooped his way around the web, Michael became affiliated with several hacker groups. First was the IWC, where he learned about IRC networks and how to exploit systems using root access. After he left IWC, Michael joined another group called TNT. It was here he first used the alias Mafia Boy, and also became better at carrying out DDoS attacks, the same attack he used to bring down several big companies. After the attacks, Michael went online to boast about it, and that was when all the trouble began. What he didn't know was that there were undercover agents in the chat room, and as soon as he claimed to be responsible for the attacks, the FBI and Canadian police started a full investigation to uncover the identity of Mafia Boy. He said, I started to notice this utility van that was parked at the end of my street at, like, Sunday at 4am. It was pretty obvious that they were surveilling my place. Michael was eventually arrested and sentenced to eight months in a youth detention camp. Kevin Paulson. There are a handful of hackers who made the right decision to move from being black hat hackers to becoming white hat hackers, and Kevin Paulson is one of them. Today, Kevin is a writer who covers cyber crimes and cyber security for major publications like Wired. But before he turned his life around, Kevin was targeted by the FBI, and he lived like a fugitive for years until he was eventually arrested. Born in Pasadena, California on November 30th, 1965, Kevin was an adopted child and was often described as shy, but his friends and family saw his potential at a very early age. However, he didn't 
didn't have a computer until later in his teenage years. To keep himself busy, Kevin turned to the telephone. Back then, phone chat lines were a thing, and Kevin, like many other teenagers, spent time talking to strangers, and sometimes they would meet up at a phone chat party. Although phone lines were nothing compared to computers, they still allowed tech-savvy teens to flex their ingenuity by manipulating the phone lines. This was known as phone freaking. Since he had little interest in school, Kevin spent most of his time playing video games and phone freaking. He met an older friend, Ronald Austin, at one of their phone chat parties, and although Austin was older and more educated, he didn't know how to hack the phone lines, so he hung around Kevin and learned from him. On his 16th birthday, Kevin got a gift. It was a TRS-80, one of the few microcomputers mass-produced for home use in the 1970s. His adoptive parents, who were farmers and already in their late 40s, had little knowledge of computers or what Kevin was doing with it, but this one gift would forever change Kevin's life. Kevin started hacking with the alias Dark Dante. Armed with a modem and his computer, Kevin and his friends hacked into the ARPANET, a network of computers that linked different universities together using telephone lines. Not only was the system crude, but it was also very insecure. Once in, the teens had access to several computers around the country. Although they did it for fun, ARPANET was a project funded by the Pentagon, which means that some of the computers had sensitive documents on them. One of these was at the University of California, Berkeley. Kevin hacked the university's computer system by guessing the password. This was a huge success for him, and perhaps it fueled his ego and blinded him so much that at one instant, Kevin logged into the network with his real name instead of his alias. That was when the feds got him. However, they allowed him to continue his rather harmless exploit, which according to his friend, was motivated by the need for control and the feeling of superiority over those whom he considered to be beneath him, a typical villain mindset. But his mistake had put the FBI on his trail. On September 22nd, 1983, without any warning, the FBI pulled up at Kevin's house in North Hollywood and arrested him. Because he was only 17 at the time, Kevin was let off the hook with a warning. His computers and other hacking devices were confiscated, while his friend Austin was sentenced to two months in custody. Kevin dodged a bullet, but failed to learn his lesson until he was arrested again at the age of 21 and sent to prison for 51 months. James Costa. He was an IT consultant at the age of 13, emancipated from his parents and lived as an adult, had a girlfriend that was five years older, was arrested for hacking, and was sentenced to 45 years in jail. James Costa was not only smart, but he lived a life that most adults wouldn't be able to afford. There was trouble at home, and the computer was James's only escape to his ideal world. Luckily, he had a head for computers, as well as a knack for business. At the age of 13, James was already earning $1,500 from the comfort of his home as an IT consultant, but he wanted to expand and his business, so he convinced his school to let him formalize the computer club, and with that privilege, he was able to take his business to the next level. The ability to persuade others is another gift that sets James apart from most kids his age. This became very obvious after James had a clash with his parents because of his lifestyle. He was missing school, partying, going out with a girl who was way older than him, keeping late nights, and doing whatever he wanted. With enough money to spare, it must have been difficult for his parents to constrain him, so they gave him an ultimatum, give up everything, and focus on school if you want to live under our roof. But James had already tasted what it felt like to be free, and money was not a problem, so it was an easy decision for him. In a shocking twist of events, the 13-year-old boy took his parents to court and demanded to be emancipated from them. According to him, I went to court and proved to a judge I was responsible enough to be on my own. Surprisingly, the judge agreed to let James live alone. With that, whatever little restraint he had over his life was removed. He now had the life that every other kid can only dream of. Unknown to him, what he felt was freedom came at a cost. He started dabbling with the underworld and became affiliated with a hacker group. He was the perfect target for these criminals who specialized in turning unwitting teens into a life of crime by luring them with the power to do as they please. According to James, a lot of it was for bragging rights, to say you pulled something off. To prove himself, James hacked into both military and commercial networks, including that of General Electric and IBM. That was when his life began to fall apart. Unknown to him, the FBI was on his tail. One morning, James woke up to a knock on his door. He staggered towards the door, and when he opened it, he was greeted by an armed FBI tactical squad. Recalling the incident, James said, I was terrified. When you're that young, because your parents always give you warnings, you expect someone to say, hey, knock it off. I never expected any action like that. Also, what came to light very quickly was that I wasn't technically a kid. When you're emancipated, they have the right to charge you as an adult. He was right about that last part. The judge slammed him with 45 years of jail time, even though he was only 14. But after serving for about a year, his sentence was suspended. Perhaps the judge only wanted to teach him the lesson that he was still a kid after all, and James was grateful. Matthew Weigman. Long before smartphone malware and computer viruses became a thing, there was another way hackers got around to causing trouble. It was known as freaking, a combination of two words, phone and freak. Phone freak
freaks were capable of manipulating phone lines to forge a call, get additional phone time, and even eavesdrop on conversations by mastering the tones at which these operations were carried out. To be a phone freak, you need to be patient, have a good memory, and spend a lot of time on the telephone. Matthew Weigman had all these qualities, but there was one thing that made him stand out from other phone freaks. He was blind. Weigman was born with optic nerve atrophy, an eye condition that made him legally blind. At the age of 11, he stumbled across party lines, which is a telephone line that serves several different customers. From then on, he quickly learned from other, more experienced phone freaks. With a keen sense of hearing and sharp memory, it only took Weigman a few years to become an expert. At first, he was only fooling around with his newfound ability. He hacked his way through telephone operators and got the personal information of employees, which he used in carrying out more hacks like getting the telephone line of a rival disconnected. He mastered spoofing, a technique that lets him display any caller ID he wanted on the receiver's end. His incredible memory helped him master dial tones and decipher the number being called. Using this technique, Weigman claimed he once called presidential candidate Mitt Romney after listening to a video where his son had dialed the number. He eventually dropped out of school in 10th grade and spent most of his time on the phone. His mother allowed him to be because she was happy he had found something he was good at. By the time he turned 14, Weigman was practically a master in nearly every aspect of freaking, including social engineering engineering and swatting. Social engineering is all about understanding the industry jargon so well that you can speak as an employee would. But the greatest skill any freak could master was swatting. It was an incredible offensive weapon, and Weigman wielded it so well. His first attempt at swatting was at a convenience store. Weigman called 911 to report an ongoing robbery, and police officers were dispatched to the store within a short time. From that day on, Weigman used his power to both intimidate and impress by swatting anyone who offended him until he became a target himself. This happened after a girl refused to have phone sex with him on the party line. Angered by these, Weigman decided to call 911 and pretended he was a gunman named John DeFano who had held the girl and her father hostage because her father had raped his sister. By the time officers arrived at the house, they met the girl and her dad alone. A year later, Weigman was identified by the FBI, but rather than charge him, he was made an informant mainly because he was still a minor, but the deal was later cut off when the FBI realized that Weigman was still hacking on the side. Left alone, Weigman continued his reign of terror. He was finally a arrested when he and his brothers went to the house of a Verizon employee who had disconnected his telephone line. Their sole purpose was to intimidate the man, but he called the police and had them all arrested. Weigman, who had just turned 18, was tried as an adult and sentenced to 11 years in prison. Richard Price Price was a high school student, and if one were to judge by academic performance alone, he wouldn't be considered a genius. However, this high schooler who scored a D in A-level computer science was ironically the same person who was considered the number one threat to US security and accused of causing more harm than the KGB. Again, ironically, Price wasn't a hardcore hacker as he was portrayed to be. Most of his hacks were achieved using software downloaded online, and not because he had exceptional coding skills like Jonathan James. So how did this 15-year-old British teenager with a passion for playing the double bass end up becoming one of the most famous hackers in the history of America? It all started at the age of 15, when Price got his first computer with the intention of using it for studies. However, the internet lured him away, and he started spending most of his time in chat rooms. It was here Price was first introduced into the world of hacking. Using Blue Box, Price hacked into phone lines and made free phone calls. As they say, seeing is believing, and with a successful first attempt, Price knew where to go whenever he needed information or software to help him break into a network. To him, hacking was more like a game that he got better at with time. He soon stopped playing around with small targets like university networks, which more or less serve as target practice. His next target was the US military system, specifically the Pentagon. Unlike his smaller targets, Targets. The Pentagon wasn't a place where he could enter and leave unnoticed. But even though the special agents at the Pentagon were aware that someone was snooping around their system, they had no idea who it was or how to stop him. From there, he moved to other targets like NASA, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and Hanscom Air Force. Once inside the systems, Price had access to every confidential document belonging to the US military. He could copy, edit, and delete files, and if he wanted to, he could shut down the entire system. The investigators who were monitoring his movement found out that he communicated with another hacker whenever he faced a challenge. They were convinced the second hacker was more skilled. On one occasion, the agents were on full alert because Price had hacked a Korean research facility while logged in from an American airbase. At the time, the US and North Korea were at odds with each other, and such an intrusion would bring damning consequences.
consequences to the United States. Luckily, it was a South Korean facility that had been breached. After trailing him around for a while, the agents got to know that the hacker used the alias Datastream Cowboy, and with that, an informant of the government infiltrated the chat room where Price hung out. He then lured Price into giving out his telephone number. That was when they got to know that Price lived in the UK. On May 12th, 1994, agents of the US government and the British police waited outside his house. Once the signal was given, the agents stormed the house, expecting to see a hardened criminal. But instead, they saw a teenager who broke down in tears. He was fined about £1,200 and the charges against him were later dropped. Oscar Levant said, There is a fine line between genius and insanity, and these teenagers proved just that. If you enjoyed watching this video, click the card on your screen to see more videos like this.